like shake hands with somebody that you don't know. One more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. Ron, put that back, back there, up there again. Let's sing it one more time. For you. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Lord, thank you for this time that we can come together. Thank you so much for this evening, for us to be able just to know that you are God and that we can trust you in everything, that you are merciful, you are trusting, you are all-powerful, and that you love us so dearly. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity tonight. Be with Brother Allen as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> good evening, guys. How are you? Yeah, it's good to see you. You look good this evening. And uh, that's right. I need glasses. That's, I don't, might need it. Man, it's so good to see you guys. We're in Luke's Gospel. And what we're doing on Sunday nights, if, if you haven't been with us here recently, we're going through the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, certainly the most significant event in the history of the world is death and resurrection of Christ. And the most important week in the history of the world that we need to pay attention to is the last week of his life and, and what led up to that. And so that, that's kind of what we've, we've been looking at here. And we're in Luke's Gospel, Luke 19. And so we're on Monday today. And next week we're going to have to pick up the pace. And I had, I had mentioned last week that we were going to break up into small groups. And, and that way we'd have time to discuss this and go a little bit deeper. And I was outvoted. And they, some folks said, there, well, there's no way we get that many tables in there. We'd have so many table groups because such a large number are coming. It, it might be tough. So uh, we're, we're going to do that tonight. I might, I might bring it back up again next week. We'll see if I get voted down then. Uh, so Luke, Luke was a historian. He was a doctor, right? Some things we've learned about Dr. Luke. And he was not an eyewitness, but we learn in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, that he did a lot of investigation. Like a good historian, a doctor, very good at details. 
he asked a lot of people different things. Now, as we look at the other Gospels, of course, Matthew and John were eyewitnesses. They were eyewitnesses to the events and heard the words of Christ. And, and then we have John Mark. Mark, on the other hand, he traveled with Peter. He traveled with Peter extensively, so he was always hearing these stories. And so these men uh, chronicled the life of Christ as they were led by, by the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to look at today is the cleansing of the temple. It's a real fascinating uh, story. It's one that you, you've heard of a lot, perhaps before. And when he cleansed the temple, uh, and you see this in all the Gospels, uh, but, it's, but it's different in each Gospel. And in fact, in the, the Gospel of John, he puts it towards the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. So they're different places. They, they include some different language and, and some uh, phrases in there. And so it begs the question, why is that? What we're going to do, just, just so you, we're all on the same page, I'm going to kind of set us up here for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to get into the text. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm going to kind of give an overview, and we'll, we'll kind of uh, get down to the, to the nitty-gritty. Uh, let me get, give you just some, some reasons why that's okay. It's okay if John records the, uh, the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of John, and the other three gospel writers put it at the end of John. Uh, first of all, none of the gospel writers at any point declare that they're going to tell every fact about Jesus that they knew. In fact, at the end of John's gospel, John said, and look, there are other events. Man, I just get a tan. I feel like I just got like warmed up. I got a glow about me now. I've been to the tanning bed now. And, and so the, uh, John's gospel at the end in chapter 20, he says, listen, if I recorded everything that was told, there wouldn't be enough, uh, there's not a library big enough to hold everything that's out there. So not only do they never say we're going to write everything, John puts a disclosure in it saying we're not going to write about everything. That's not the point. As they're being led by the Holy Spirit of God, they're trying to make us hit a particular theme. As we talked about last week, Luke, he's trying to reach a Gentile audience. That's why we don't have a genealogy at the beginning to him going back to Abraham. It's not important to him. It's not important to him. That's why we have so, so much in the Gospel of Luke is Jesus the Son of God. Because that would be very important uh, to a Gentile audience. And so, so that, that's another reason uh, why it's not important is that none of the, the writers ever say that this is a chronological story. Let me start at the beginning. Then this happened. Then that happened. And then the final thing, this. Now, they all end with death, burial, death, burial and resurrection of Christ. But that's never the intention. Now, for you and I in a Western mindset, that seems strange. Usually when you and I, when we chronicle a story, we do it chronologically. We tell an order from beginning to end. But you have to understand a Jewish mindset that they don't think one, two, three. Uh, kind of what's called linear thought. You and I, we have linear thought. But in the Middle East in particular, it's called circular thought. They might start at one and then they'll start talking about five and then they'll start talking about eight. And now I know what you guys are thinking. Well, that reminds us of Alan. That's just someone's ADD. You know, you're jumping around all the time. Okay, if that helps you process the way they thought, then that's okay. Uh, and so each author is trying to make a particular point. And he pulls stories from different places as he's led by the Holy Spirit to come. So this one message makes the impact. Luke is trying to reach Gentiles. He's not trying to tell a chronological story of the life of Christ. He's trying to reach Gentiles. So as he's writing, being led by the Holy Spirit, he's pulling stories out and they're coming together. And we're going to see how he does that here tonight in particular in, in Luke 19 and, and 21. And so, just so that's helpful. Augustine, Augustine was a pastor in North Africa in a place called Hippo. Famous, famous pastor in, in the 5th uh, century A.D. This is what he said about the Gospels. There is no discrepancy in the Gospels as to the facts. Although one tells one detail, which another passes over or describes differently. Rather, they supplement each other when compared and thus give uh, direction to the mind of the reader. Uh, now, in our last session, our last session... We, we talked about how the crowd wanted a conquering king. But Jesus came 
as a suffering servant. And that's, again, another theme that you see throughout the whole gospel of Luke that is culminated in these last few chapters. He proves that he's truly the suffering servant, the suffering king coming to die for his people. So what we have here in this scenario is we, we're coming, it's the, the Passover has happened and Passover comes, everybody comes to Jerusalem to celebrate this great meal. And so they're all, they're all coming there and, and, and Christ is coming and he has people coming with him and last week they were singing and rejoicing the crowd was growing around him and he was coming into the temple I share that as a reminder for last week but also it's important for tonight because this was a typical scenario whenever a ruler came into any Roman city including Jerusalem if if a Herod came in or some uh, diplomat came in there was always a series of things would happen before, they wouldn't just come and enter the city. Kind of word, the her heralds would go out and say, hey, you know, uh, counselor, you know, so-and-so's here. I was thinking Star Wars. My, my son's on, you know, counselor Palpatine. You know, counselor Palpatine's here. And, and so, oh, he's, he's here. And so they would go out and they would ga gather around counselor Palpatine. Okay? And, and so that's the first thing. He kind of would draw a crowd. And, and whenever the crowd seemed large enough, uh, for his caliber and his expertise, the next thing would happen. The second thing would happen is they would begin to sing. They would begin to sing songs of praise. Well, those two things, keep in mind, have already happened. We looked at those last week. So we see all these pieces, the crowd gathered, and they began to uh, sing praises. Hosean in the highest was the song, Palm Branches Went Down, which in some ways leads us into the third step. Symbolic uh, tokens would be given or actions taken. We're going to see that also in tonight's study as Jesus cleanses the temple. He clears the temple. And so, so he's, he's proving uh, that, that he is the conquering king. He's coming to rule. The fourth thing and most significant, and this is kind of interesting, uh, considering you know, the pagan world this all fell in, that the fourth thing they would do is they would go to the temple and make a sacrifice. They would, they would come after all these things. They would be paraded in. Things would be given out. But he would, they would go to the temple and they'd make a sacrifice. Well, ultimately, that's what Christ is coming to do, right? But, but tonight, what we're going to look, he goes in the temple and he declares it unworthy and unfit. And its destruction is coming. But then he makes the ultimate sacrifice. And so it's just kind of, you know, as, as you look at that, so it begins to make sense in the mind of a, a Palestinian during this time, and they begin to put all this together. And like, oh man, he is the ruler. He is the conquering king. And, and, and understanding in a Gentile world, this would have been very significant. That's why Luke is including these four, four steps and saying, hey, th this is who I am. Go ahead and you can keep your finger in Luke's gospel and turn to uh, Psalm 118. We began looking at this last week, and I, I just kind of want to. Uh, We'll, we'll pretty much finish it up tonight. Uh, Psalm, Psalm uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18 uh, were basically read in the Passover. So, you know, they, they would come as they were celebrating the Passover, which was celebrating God delivering the people from Israel, from captivity in Egypt, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And so Psalm 18 would be the final one sung. All right, it's the final one. And it's talking about the coming king. And so, uh, let's, in Psalm 118, um, and, and here's this progression that, that we see that we, we just talked about. First, there would be the songs of praise beginning in verse 14. Um, and I might not read all of it. But, so, it's, first, it's the songs of praise. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting, the salvation is in the tents of the righteous the right hand of the Lord uh, does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die but live. And, you know, it's praise. And so, so there's this praise that's going on. And so at the Passover, as they go out, they're singing this. Uh, I pointed out last week, that's why I, I think it's Matthew that says, after they left, they went out and sung hymns. Well, this is what they were singing. They were singing Psalm, Psalm 118. 
Well, the second thing they would have read at the beginning of verse 19 as they go through the gates. So they're singing, and then they come through the gates. Verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I, I shall enter through them, and I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. Um, continue in verse uh, 21. I, I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone. So the gate, it says, you know, enter through the gate. We read in John's gospel, Jesus says, I am the gate. And so at this point, Jesus is entering through uh, the gate and entering into the city. And then finally in uh, Psalm 118, beginning in verse 26, we see the sacrifice. Uh, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. And so so, so you see this progression. Jesus is fulfilling Psalm 118. Now I understand to you and I some of this is maybe going in one ear out the other. And and I, I completely understand that. But understand the significance to a first century individual reading this. This is what they were just steeped in. And they understood all this imagery. And so as they looked at Jesus, they saw the fulfillment and the picture of everything they had read. From childhood, reading this psalm. And growing up as a teenager, young adult, married, doing this with his family. And they come together and all of a sudden they begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together here. In Psalm uh, 118. And, and we even see the, the final sacrifices. Jesus is going to go, uh, go into the, to the temple. Um, and he comes in and he's going to clean it out. Uh, but before, before we read the text. And you turn back to Luke's gospel if you want. Luke 19. Uh, we'll be there in just a moment. Um, what was going on at the time? Why would Jesus. And we're going to see him just come in. He's going to knock over tables. He's going he's to clean this place out. Why would he do that? Well, Moses, uh, when the tabernacle was set up uh, for the people of God to have a church, a place to come worship, uh, he said, listen, every time you come, any male over the age of 20, you have to bring a, a, a half of a shekel. All right? And, and so it was something that they had to bring every time they came or their, their worship wouldn't be pleasing to God. Well, that money didn't exist anymore. Uh, the Romans had denarii. And so what would happen is you had to have that half shekel. And so money changers, exchangers, would be set up in, in the temple courts where the Gentiles were supposed to worship. So they, they, they'd come up, and, and basically it's kind of like this. All right, you give me a denarii, I give you a piece of Monopoly money. <laughs> and that's, that's how the trade. And so they... they you know, they had this monopoly money given to them that they could go make a sacrifice. And the money changers had the real money. And, and so every, these people were getting rich off of it. And at this point in history, um, the high priest was no longer a descendant from Aaron. But it was an appointed position by the Roman government. So, I mean, you know, the church at this point was pretty, pretty corrupt. I mean, more than likely... You know, if you have a, 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 a government that is conquering a city, and they say, all right, we're going to decide who your high priest is, and they choose one, it's going to be somebody corrupt. So the high priest would go to the, to the money changers, and they would say, listen, all right, um, I want 10%, and you can keep whatever else you want to charge. And that's kind of how it would work. So the money changers, okay, uh, the high priest wants 10%. Well, I, I at least want 5%. So that's, that's how they would set the exchange rate. And they were taking advantage of people. Uh, the Is- Israelites, they were a poor people. They were nom- nomadic, uh, many of them. And so as, as they would travel all the way to Jerusalem with their families. And it was required. It was required by the law of God. If you didn't have money, you still had to go. You had to figure it out. You had to go with friends. You had to go with family. There's no excuses. Everybody had to pack up and go to Jerusalem. It was the only temple in the whole place. that they had to come to the temple to make their sacrifices. Or, or they, they, they were not a, a good Jew. And, and so, you know, the first, first thing, you have, have these money changers. 
that are around and you, and you see the corruption. That the temple uh, was not doing what it was supposed to do. Uh, first of all, just the corruption uh, from those in charge. And you had the, uh, those that were exchanging uh, money. Um, but perhaps, in, in some ways, more disturbing. More disturbing is that um, it, it, the temple was supposed to be a place for all nations. All people. There's not at one point in time where God was just the God of Israel. It was always a promise to the nations. In fact, uh, if, if somebody, I keep on getting you out of uh, Luke, but in 1 King, Kings, there's some, um, uh, some important information here that I think is helpful for us. In 1 Kings chapter 8, and you can either uh, turn there or you can listen to me, but 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41 he says, also concerning the foreigner uh, who is not of the people of Israel, when he comes from a far country for your namesake, capital Y on the earth, speaking of God, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this house here in heaven, your dwelling place, and, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls you in order uh, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, to fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I built is called by your name. Uh, so to kind of summarize there, what he was saying is that he said, listen, people around the world are going to hear about you, God. They're going to hear about your mighty works. They're going to hear about all the amazing things you've done, and they're going to come. And that's a good thing, that, that his house was always... Uh, for all people. And so when they made the temple, they made, they made a, what was called a court for the Gentiles. And it was a place that if you weren't a Jew, you could still come in. It'd be kind of like, you know, all of us, we get to come in here. Uh, but but if, you know, if you're not a Jew, then you're going to go to the gym and we're going to simulcast it down there for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it wouldn't be that far away. It would be an earshot, and, but it would be on the other side of a wall. And be in a different place. And, and so what had happened, though, while it was no longer a, a place of worship for the nations, is that not only were they exchanging money there, but they were also required to bring sacrifices. So there were sheep, there were doves, there had been cattle. And this was supposed to be their sanctuary. I mean, can you imagine next Sunday morning... If you came, and we had animals all throughout here, kind of vendors around the side. You know, no coffee vendors, right? For us on the Daniel Fast, that, that's would be torture. But, uh, you know, you, you'd have that around. And imagine them there for days and weeks. They'd bring in straw. They would eat there, and they would do other things there. Imagine the stench that would develop over time. And so, and this was the place the Gentiles were, were coming to worship. And this is the context for which Jesus comes and he sees all of this. He sees everything uh, that, that was taking place. I guess the third thing I'd, I'd mention just that, that would just really lit his fire. Not only uh, that it was no longer a, a, nation, a place uh, for them to come and worship, uh, but it was no longer a, a place of prayer. Uh, it was no longer... Uh, a place that it was supposed to be. And they didn't recognize uh, that Jesus, Jesus was the, he that fulfilled this prophecy. All right, let's go ahead and turn to Luke 19. Luke 19. Verse 46. Luke 19, 46. Let's start in 45. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. Jesus is combining here two Old Testament prophecies to describe what he sees here. He's, he's saying, one, hey, what has happened is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. prophecy. Two, he's saying it's not right. It's not good. Uh, the first is that it should be a, a house of prayer. 
um, in Isaiah's gospel, or excuse me, in the book of Isaiah, that's where this is. That it says, that my house shall be a house of prayer for what? All nations. My house should be a house of prayer for all nations. And so he comes in, and as you're reading John's gospel, it says that he, he makes a whip. He, he, in it, he's like watching this. And you can almost just picture, I mean, he's just getting furious that this has happened. And he makes a whip, and the Bible says that he goes in, and he's going in with that whip, and he's driving out animals, and he's kicking over tables, and he, and he literally runs the money changers out of the temple. In other words, the true king is taking control of the temple. The true priest is taking control of the temple. And so uh, here, here in this setting, he's coming and, he's, and he sees, man, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. And there's dung here and there, there's sheep urine over here. And, and there's, there's people back here cheating people out of money. There's people here exploiting the poor. And this, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, everyone's welcome here. And, and it comes, and, and he sees this sight that is, that is not pleasant uh, for anyone uh, to see. Um, verse 47. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on every word that he said. That, that Jesus came into the temple and he, and he took complete control. That he was in complete charge of the situation here. Uh, the, the quote uh, from Den of Thieves is from Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. And it kind of a similar situation that he's, he's telling the people uh, there in Jeremiah. He's saying, look, look the, the temple is supposed to be a place where you come and you receive forgiveness of sins. But, but Jeremiah tells them, you can't keep coming to the temple and offering sacrifices and then just keep living the same way. That's why he calls it a den of thieves or a den of robbers, uh, some translation, depending on what you have. Jeremiah says, he says, look, your sacrifice is useless. You can come and you can continue to give money, you can give sheep, you can give doves, but you go out and, and you just sin, that's not going to cover, cover your sins. Because it's useless, it's, it's futile to, to continue to come out and, and to do those things and expect it to happen. Uh, Jesus, as we talked about earlier, this is kind of interesting. The, um, as he comes and he, he comes and basically he's saying this temple is defiled. As when he, when he runs everybody, runs everybody says, this temple is gone. And in fact, he prophesies that the temple is going to be destroyed. And he says, this temple is going to be destroyed in, in this many years. And that's what happens. And later that prophecy comes true. But the temple that they found themselves in um, was not the temple that they thought it was. And, and what I mean by that is when, when God, when they built the temple, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, his spirit came down on that temple. But... When the Babylonians, kind of interesting with our Daniel study, when, when the Babylonians came and took Israel captive, never again did the Spirit of God enter the temple. Even when it was rebuilt, 70 years, you know, they go into Babylon and they're, they're there 70 years. Jeremiah says, we're going to be in captivity 70 years. Boom, 70 years. Prophecy comes true. They come back, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, they rebuild the temple. And it's, it's not as big as it was before, but like at least we have a temple. But the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord never again entered the temple. Um, and, and so it kind of is interesting as we look, look at that uh, passage. Uh, look in Ezekiel chapter 10, uh, verse 18 and 19. Ezekiel chapter 10, 18 and 19. That was a little harder to find, ain't it? Is Ezekiel 10, 18 and 19. 
Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. When the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of, excuse me, the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. And, and as we look in scripture, this is, this is when we see the withdrawal of the glory of God. Back in Luke's gospel, so Monday, we have the triumphal entry on Sunday, and then we have uh, the temple uh, cleansing that we just read about. And then in chapter 20, he begins to talk about um, various uh, parables that he gives. There's more parables in Luke's gospel than any other gospel combined. Uh, Luke, Luke is a storyteller. He's, he's, he's telling virtually maybe all the parables that he could possibly have got his hands on. And it's, it's showing Jesus' authority um, and how he is in control of the situation. And so that's, that's kind of chapter 20. You see a lot of teaching. And so we have a whole, whole chapter, basically, of Jesus teaching in the temple. So, I mean, just picture that just for a moment. You know, he comes in and the place is a wreck. He cleanses it out. He just he drives everybody out. And, and then for a day, he teaches in that temple. I, I, I couldn't really find where he taught, but in my mind, I'm envisioning that he taught in the court of the Gentiles. The, right there where he cleansed it out. And so a whole day of teaching from daylight to dark. He's teaching the word of God. He's teaching parables. And that's why the Pharisees, I mean, they are livid. I mean, they're mad. That's why they ask him, what authority by which do you do this? Is that how you say that? That sounded King James. That was pretty good, wasn't it? And so he says, what authority are you doing this by? And because not only is this rabbi, I mean, this young guy from Nazareth, you know, doing all, you know, that, that was our livelihood. We were, you know, that was my, my, my kid's pension for college, you know. You just drove out of the temple, and they're mad about that. But now all of a sudden, he's teaching in the court of the Gentiles. Had never been done. Never, ever, ever been done. Not once been done. The teaching was always in the main place. And then you could hear from the court of the Gentiles, but the teaching was never done that, there. So Jesus make, making that bridge. And then um, you just continue, and then you have the, the widow's gift. Now look in chapter 21. So this is all happening. Okay. Verse 1. And he, he looked up. So he's in the temple. He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they are all out of their surplus put in their offering. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And, and so, you know, that, that famous story, right? The, the widow's man that she comes, and, and he's, he's watching what's happening. And, and he's calling them to task. This shouldn't be. And, and he's saying, this is the way it should be. Verse 5. And while some of them were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and, and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will be not not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. Um, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that would happen about 40, 40 years later in 70 AD when the Romans came in. Again, we talked about that last week and they just demolished the city. They, they demolished the temple. Incidentally, this is what he's later, one of the things he's charged of, you know, when he, when he comes before the courts is this very thing. Um, and this, this statement is what they point back to. Verse 7, they questioned him saying, Teacher, when therefore were these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first. But the end... But the end does not follow immediately. And so beginning in verse 10, uh, going through verse 24, uh, we see him talking about things to come. 
And so he's talking about end times and what's going to happen. Uh, when, when will you know uh, the kingdom is inaugurated? Because one thing, the Jews, they were looking for a king to come right then and deliver them. They were looking for somebody that was going to come and take over the Romans. But that wasn't God's plan. His, his kingdom was inaugurated when, it, when he came. But it's not going to be consummated till he returns. And so he's, he's kind of laying it out for his disciples. He's laying it out for us in verses 10 through 24. You, you know, we live in the already but the not yet. That we already live in God's kingdom. But yet not everything is realized. That's why we have so many troubles in this life. He is, he's already started his kingdom. We're part of his kingdom. But the fulfillment of everything in his kingdom hasn't, hasn't come into effect yet until he returns. And at the beginning of verse 25, he begins to talk about his return. The return of Christ. Verse 25, the Bible says, There will be a sign in the sun and the moon and the stars, and on the earth dis dismay among the nations and perplexity at this roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So it's, it's going to be so devastating environmentally during those times and storms coming that there's going to be some things happen that we've never seen before. Verse 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Verse 29. Then he told them a parable. Now, we didn't talk about the other parables, but this one is important for our discussion. Uh, in this parable, we, we see in different places. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you that the generation, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. This, this parable of the fig tree, he comes up and he, it, it's this fig tree and it's, 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 bearing, it's bearing leaves. And the, the figs would often come in the winter months. And so you see this fig tree and, it, and it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's showing leaves, but it's not bearing any, any fruit. And, and the reason why Luke placed this parable here is because it describes the temple. Everybody's coming uh, to Passover. They're coming to, uh, Sab on the Sabbath. Or, uh, they're coming to the synagogue. And everything looks good on the outside. It's bearing leaves. But on the inside, there's just decay. Uh, and, and it can be true for, for you and I. It, it can be true in our generation that, that everything looks good on the outside. It's bearing leaves. But on the inside, there's decay. There's sin in our life. Everything's not so good at home. Everything's not so right in our lives. And, and so this parable is a commentary on the temple. Uh, it's a commentary on, on what is taking place and what Jesus is coming into, why he came and he uh, came and, and cleared it out. Now, the, the fig tree is, is kind of interesting, but then he goes into, he says, this generation will not pass away until I come again. Uh, well, then it becomes a question, what did he mean by this generation? Obviously, he didn't mean to those he was speaking to right then. And, and so there, there are several options out there. One, one option that some people look at, this generation uh, means whenever Christ returns and, until everything is made right from the beginning of that time to the final fulfillment, whatever generation is alive at that time will see the fulfillment of it. Others believe that this generation means uh, believers from all generations. In, in other words, it, it's the church age. That this generation, uh, that from the coming of Christ to his return, is referring to this generation. Um, uh, here in the text, uh, it could be as uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter refers to this chosen generation. A chosen generation uh, royal priesthood. Um, others think it could mean 
uh, just basically those that are scoffers uh, in every age. Those that are, as Paul talks about in Philippians, a crooked and depraved generation. Um, so exactly what does it mean? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it means in terms of, you know, this generation will not pass away. Which one does it mean? I'm not for sure. But this I'm confident in. I know what Christ says will come true. And, and one, one way we know that from even looking at this passage tonight is he gives us two signs. Uh, first, he talks about the destruction of the temple. That happened 40 years later. And it happened just as Jesus predicted it would happen. So we live in between the first sign and the second sign. Uh, we, we also read in Scripture that, that whenever a, a, Gentile, uh, a, a Gentile army invades Jerusalem and basically wipes it out, that, it, that it's going to be sometime between the destruction of Jerusalem and when that happens again. And so we live in between those times. So if Jesus was right on the first one, why would, why would we think he wouldn't be right on the second one? That he's going to return. Uh, and that th those things which he prophesied are going to come true. Um, well, of course, of course they are. And of course they will. Um, finally, he, he ends with these words. Um, but my words will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. Kind of interesting concept. He says, listen, everything that you see around you, it will all pass away before anything that I say does not come true. That, that you can take what I say and you can take it to the bank. And that you can trust me that whatever I say is going to happen is going to happen. And setting ourselves up for, uh, for, the, for the coming weeks. Last week, we began on Sunday. On Sunday, as Jesus came and he came in and they were declaring that he was king. On day two, Monday, he comes in and he says, Hey, look, I am the king. Watch, I'm coming in and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean this temple out and I'm going to make things right. I'm going to prove that I am the right priest and that, that I'm going to make all things right. And we're going to end, we're going to end on the fifth Sunday when we come together that he makes the ultimate sacrifice in, in giving of his own, own life. Um, I want to, to look at, at one uh, last note of interest in, in chapter 21, verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead you an, an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. That's kind of a crazy thing to be called to, isn't it? You know, as he's teaching again, he's, he's, he's teaching here in his last days. It's at the Passover. And you, you would have a lot of people, they're kind of looking for rabbis to follow. And they're thinking, man, this rabbi Jesus... Man, I want to follow him. And they hear all these great stories. They see his power and they see his authority. But once again, Jesus draws a line in the sand. And he says, you know what? Following me, you need to know it's not going to be easy. In fact, let me tell you some things that are going to happen to you. Let me tell you about the great persecution that will come upon you. But he doesn't leave them there. He says, you're going to be arrested. But know in those times of difficulties, know that I will never leave you nor will I, will I ever forsake you. I will, I will give you words to speak. But he doesn't talk about their deliverance, does he? 
Not immediate deliverance, but ultimately, he says, verse 19, by your endurance you will gain your lives. You know, that's a recurring theme in the gospel. In order to gain your life, you must lose your life. Jesus said, for us to, to come after him, we must deny ourselves, come after, pick up our cross and come after him. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat fall to the ground and die, it will not produce fruit. That, that we are called to lay down our lives. And Christ is our example of that as he's coming into Jerusalem. He's going to lay down his life in the coming pages of this gospel. And he calls us to do the very same thing, to lay down our lives, to die to ourselves. I wanted to share, the reason why I'm, I'm going there is in uh, just something in my time uh, alone with the Lord the last couple of weeks, just something that God spoke into to my life, uh, into my heart. And I want to share that with you. In uh, Romans chapter 6, now I believe God's just kind of stirring up something in me. So you might hear this again on a Sunday morning, a sermon at, at some point. And uh, I don't have my watch. What time do y'all have? Thank you. All right. Chapter 6, verse 7, he says, For he who has died is freed from sin. He who has died is free from sin. And that just, that was kind of a light to me. I mean, it was kind of a flashing light to me. Something I don't think I'd ever seen before. I've always read and even talked about how we have victory over the sin in our lives through Christ. Um, but, but then I, I see something here that we need to do. In order to have victory over the, our struggles in our lives, it says, For he who has died is freed from sin. The, the, the writings, the epistles, continue that theme that we must die to ourselves. You know, it didn't stop with Christ on the cross. But you and I have, have a decision to make every day. And that's to die to ourselves. To die to our selfish needs. Uh, that, that we feel that we need to be first. And it's, it's dying to ourselves that we might put our spouses first. We might put our kids before ourselves. And, and those are the easy ones. But to die to ourselves, putting complete strangers before, before us. Um, you know, fasting is a great picture of that. It's dying to ourselves. and Those things that we earnestly desire, fleshly. And saying, I'm going to die to myself, that I might live for Christ. This is also, uh, in light of the baptisms this morning and the ones we'll have next week, let's pick up in verse 1, and we're going to finish with this, of chapter 6 of Romans. What, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall... We who died to sin still live in it. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism and death. So as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might walk in newness of life. That's why you hear me when I'm baptized. This is the verse this comes from, that we are buried with him in his death and were raised to walk in newness of life. This is... The verse we're referring to whenever someone is baptized. This is what we did this morning. This is what we'll do next Sunday morning when someone is baptized. The baptism is that picture of participating in the death of Christ. When you go down in the water, that's like when Christ died and was buried. Not only are you saying uh, to a watching world you believe that Jesus died, but what you're also doing is you're associating with Christ in his death. You're saying today... I'm dying to myself. It's no longer me. I'm going to live for God. That old person is gone, and I'm alive anew with God. Verse 5. For if we have become united with him in his likeness of his death, certainly we shall also uh, be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. So when we come up out of the water of baptism, it's a picture of the resurrection. 
When we come up out of the water, people see us coming up out of the water, and they say they believe in the resurrection of Christ. Not only are we saying we believe in, in that event that happened in history, but what we're also saying is that we've been raised from the dead, that we're walking anew and fresh in the light of God. And then back to verse 7. For he who has died is free from sin. You know, tonight, uh, you know, as we come and uh, here tonight and look at God's word, you know, I just want to leave you with just some questions to, to think about. What are, what are the areas in your life that you need to die to? Uh, what, what are those areas in your life that you need to no longer participate in? What, what are those things that, that you need to say tonight? That, that I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but he lives in me, he lives through me, and he has control of my life. And until you die to yourself, you're not going to have victory over those areas of your life that you struggle with. You, you, it's a, and it's a daily event. It's getting up daily and saying, I'm going to die today. And then, then he says here again, just going back, for he who has died is free from that. But what happens is we continue to feed those things, feed that sin in our life. But it's got to die. It's got to stop. Let me pray for us. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we want to thank you for this time tonight to, to study your word. And, and God, we're so thankful that you died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we might be declared sons and daughters of God. Lord, help us to have courage and strength to die to ourselves, to die to those things in our life that keep us from knowing you better, that keep us from growing in you, that keep us uh, from come, becoming like you and reflecting your glory. God, we know that in you that we have strength to overcome anything this world throws at us. God, that, that through the blood of Christ, we have victory over the sin in our life and that we can walk in forgiveness and mercy and grace. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, I also I, I wanted to, to share with, with you guys tonight uh, something important to be praying about. Um, Nathan, Pastor Nathan, is going to be uh, stepping down from ministry for a while uh, to focus on his family. And so I uh, wanted to share that with you guys tonight. We wanted to uh, share it with the church family on a Sunday night because we we know this is a praying group, and uh, and so we knew you guys would pray pray for them and pray for Nathan and Elizabeth as they take this time to focus on their marriage and focus on on their family. Um, and the, Nathan's last day as uh, as staff here at Emmanuel will be the last day of January, but they're still staying here in Corbin and he he's looking for a job. So you you guys might know of a of a, a good job for, for Nathan, would be a good fit. And so he and his family have, uh, have roots here. And so we're excited to still have them here at Emmanuel and still have them here in Corbin and just look for opportunities to love on them and encourage them and speak hope into their lives and speak truth into their lives. And, and we, we love these guys and we love their kids and we just believe God's best for them. And uh, uh, Pastor Nathan's here tonight and Liz is in the nursery keeping kids. So... Uh, we love these guys and just look for an opportunity to encourage them. So, All right, guys, appreciate you. Have a good evening.